Hello there, I'm Kaz, and welcome to the final part of Spectre of September. After two very successful DS games, development for the third and latest installment in the Spectre series was taken from Jupiter and handed over to Genki, a studio responsible for the abysmal Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon video game, the atrocious Kengo Legend of the Nine, and a massive amount of racing games, which, as you can probably guess, aren't very good. And they're going to be making the next game in a series of highly successful DS RPGs on a completely different console with a completely different control scheme. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, Disney. Right up there with having Pixar make a sequel to Cars. Okay, in all fairness, Genki was also the studio to bring us the J Cocoon series, and the game's producer, Kentaro Rizai, was still on board for this installment, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt for Spectrobe's origins. Komainu, you little glutton. You sure do love attention, don't you? Okay, coming on Sector W now. Our story opens as Roland and Dina are once again sent out to investigate a portal gate. Only this time, things don't go quite as planned. Whoa, what's going on? Gina, what is it? I don't know. Everything went haywire as soon as we... Huh? The ship's getting sucked into that portal! What? <laughs> the two are sent through the portal to an entirely different galaxy with no means returning. We're still is at the crawl, once again, threatening to destroy all the planets in the star system, so Roland and Gina must defeat the crawl for the final time and unravel the mystery behind Crux, the main villain from the last game. Long story short, the plot is terrible. It's poorly written dribble that focuses on a villain who becomes less interesting the more you learn about him. And you learn a lot about him. The title should have been Crux's Origins. We learn nothing about the Spectrobes aside from they existed a long time ago. Yes, fossilized beings living a long time ago. Imagine that. Furthermore, the writers repeated the mistakes of Beyond the Portals by removing elements in the story that would have made for a compelling narrative. In this case, Aldus. Call me Aldus. Aldus was the man from the first game who discovered in the pod. He's a Spectroids master from another universe with an abundance of knowledge on the Spectroids and Crawl, carrying with him a pinch of tragedy. The reason he left his home galaxy? It was to find the Spectroids in order to save its people from the invading Crawl. But his ship crashed and he went into hibernation while his home planet and people died off. He's not a character that you'll see pop up in a top 10 best video game character list, but for the decreasingly serious tone throughout the series, his backstory was easily the most interesting and developed part of the story that held a ton of potential. Origins would have been a great opportunity to tell the story of how he ended up leaving his home planet and show just how bad things were for his galaxy. Tell his origin and how he wound up being the last of his own kind, maybe tying it into Crux's own history if you really want to go that route. At the very least, include him in the plot. But no, he doesn't have anything to do with Spectro's origins. There's not even a throwaway line, he's just gone for some reason. Even putting that aside, the plot is predictable, the new characters that are here to replace the old ones are irritating, and anything potentially interesting that is presented ends up being a complete waste of time. Maybe, if you have young kids, they might enjoy it. But to the rest of you, the story only serves to test how long you'll listen to this poorly written dribble before you take that Wii remote of yours and smash the TV with it. Sometimes, less is more. The less you focus on the terrible story and villains, the more you can appreciate everything else the game does right. Once again, Spectro's Origin takes the same template as the DS installment, that being five monsters underground to fight monsters on land, but as you can already tell, the game has seen some radical changes to gameplay moving from handheld to home console. Each location has to explore some fairly expansive environment, solving simple puzzles, slaying crawl, and searching for minerals and spectrums along the way, usually culminating with a boss at the end of each one. The puzzle elements can be split into two kinds, those for humans and those for spectrobes. The human puzzles involve the player interacting with the environment, usually by picking up something and placing it elsewhere, while the spectrobes part will have one of your three child spectrobes go through small corridors or form a bridge, both of which help you further progress through the area. The former of the two are relatively light on challenge, but they do help break up the section between battles and help add some variety to the mix. The parts where you take control of child spectrums, on the other hand, add nothing to the game but padding that, quite frankly, the game would have been much better without. To say that they're forgettable would imply that any part of it would have you use your brain to store any memories of these sections to begin with. Fortunately, that's not where the meat of the game lies. More than anything else, you'll find yourself locked in combat against the crawl. Combat will have you battling several crawl at once alongside a single spectrum, but this time around, Roland can actually deal some damage. 
We went from Merlang being useless in the first game, to pointless in the second one, to actually being able to hold his own in battle, though the Spectres still do far more damage in combat than him or Gina. Yes, for the first time in the series, the character who is meant to be the lead is playable in battle. It only took them three games to realize, hey, we have people playing this who don't have white chromosome and a female character you can't play as. We should probably fix that. It also didn't take them long to realize that having co-op in a game about teamwork makes perfect sense since you can pair up with a buddy and let them fight alongside you in battle. The combat itself is enjoyable enough on your own and has a ton of options for approaching each encounter. Origins boasts a grand roster of equipment ranging from the usual swords and shields to gloves and blasters, each having their own properties and patterns to use them. It's really fun to find the best setup that works for you and your team. Between this and the ability to swap spectroids mid-battle, these encounters present a plethora of possibilities in combat. There's no waggle to the controls either, which surprised me. But while the combat is blissfully fun, it's not the best, nor the most important change made to the series. Collecting minerals is as simple as flicking your wrist and laying back as the AI picks it up for you. Thank you, Genki. Oh sure, you'll occasionally find a mineral that you can drill out of a block, but you don't have to waste hours searching every square inch for them and digging them up to feed your monsters constantly. Besides, if you don't want it, you can drop it. Speaking of which, drilling has seen the most drastic changes out of all the games. It's treated more as a mini game than it is a key mechanic, starting off with you scanning the pod, choosing your tool, angling the block just right, and very carefully removing all the surrounding stone. At the end, you blow off the remaining debris and are given a rank based on how fast you finished and how little damage you cost. The higher the ranking, the better possible for you to awaken, which you do by flicking the Weaver mode and unchecking Harmony. Not like that. Once again, the controls here are spot on. At least, as spot on as a game without Wii Motion Plus can be. And it's a good thing too, since you'll want to make sure that every swing, slice, and swipe is made as precise as possible to beat your best record and get the most powerful allies available. You can really tell that Genki learned from the flaws of its predecessor's mechanics, taking a diamond in the rough and carefully refining all the flaws in the cut to make it a shining gem. However, all that refinement, it comes at a loss of identity. It still feels like a Spectrum's game, but something about it comes off as something less unique than its previous installments. Boss battles aren't bad, but they're pretty standard and generic in between. Attack the glowing weak spot, dodge, rice ball, rinse and repeat. Even small things like renaming the elements to plant, fire, and water make it feel more like your average 90s Pokemon cash-in than it does Spectrobes. It can get a wee bit repetitive near the end, but not enough to make you put down your controller. From beginning to end, Spectrobes' origin is thoroughly engaging, an absolute blast to play through. It's easily the best of the Spectrobes trilogy, both design-wise and visually. Now, obviously the latter goes without saying, Origin has the best hardware to work with and better visuals were to be expected on the Wii. And while it isn't a great looking game, it certainly is eye pleasing. You have your grasslands, desert, ice world, fire world, and they all look fine, if a bit generic. The creatures are wonderfully designed and characters show off their personalities more than ever before, for better or for worse. The music is filled with some bland, uninteresting tracks that you'll forget the melody of while you're still playing it, but the series never had good music to begin with, so that's not too surprising. It's also not a shock that, as I've mentioned before, the voice acting is, uh... Somebody! Please! Yeah, it's terrible. The actors are overselling every single line and come off as unbelievable, even obnoxious at times. Then again, they could have gone with this. What were you gonna do? Fight those crawl all by yourself? Recklessness! Pure recklessness! Oh gosh, that's awful. And hilarious, but those are my favorite combinations, so I like it. <laughs> now I'm just thankful that the creators never got Gina to sing. Creature sounds, on the other hand, are superb, mainly because they sound like these strange alien beasts and not a dying robot like they do in the Pokemon series. Okay, look, I tried to avoid comparing Spectros to Pokemon, but this... This was simply unavoidable. To me, this is a million times more pleasing to my ears than the high-pitched screeches of discovering this in a cave 15 years after Pokemon was made when they are on a console with far better sound capabilities than this. Inexcusable. Spectre Dorian does the unthinkable. It actually takes advantage of the Wii's hardware, and not only gives the Spectres a voice for the first times in the game, but Gasp makes them sound natural too. 
It is, in a word, EXCELLENT! Let's be clear, it's no shining down to stare and odd, but Spectre's Origins presentation does have some fine points to it. Spectre's Origins is surprising in many ways, turning out to be the best in the Spectral trilogy and one of the few Wii RPGs that I can actually recommend. And let's be honest, Wii owners, there's maybe three Wii games that are RPGs that are worth owning, that being the Ringfall trilogy, and that's about it. So take your pick. Thank you for joining me for Spectre of Timber, and as always, game on, my friends. You know, I'm just gonna walk out.